Hey everybody, how are you doing? So this video will be a special one. As the channel grows more and more, we actually just reached uh, 55,000 subscribers, but it's completely amazing. So thank you so much for your support. I really appreciate that. And I also want to say sorry to you because I didn't value this support. You know, I didn't do live streaming on YouTube for the last couple of months as I promised you and I didn't do any community update. I just pumped out more and more tutorial videos, what you actually enjoy watching. But I also thought, well, from time to time I get a lot of interesting questions or a lot of feedback on some of my videos that I just need to address in a video. But I also think it wouldn't be worth making a dedicated video for some of these uh, questions because I can probably just answer them in a few seconds or even in one or two minutes. So I had the idea, why not make something like a Q&A video where I just collect some of your questions or feedbacks or comments and I just, yeah, answer them in a video like this. But if you have any questions for me now that you want to see addressing in a video like this, well then put them in the comments below because this will be the first video of the series. So any comments that I get on this video, I will probably address in the next one in a couple of weeks or yeah, I, I actually don't know how frequently I will do this, but I already collected some interesting feedback on some of my videos, so I will go over them one by one and try to comment on these uh, things. So the first a question that I got from Ryan Cotes, I love the drawings in your videos. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Is that just an iPad app or are you screen capturing the iPad? Well, that's a pretty great question. I sometimes get that on some of the videos where you see my drawings on the screen where I explain something. So this is actually my Samsung Galaxy Tab S7, I, I guess. And I have connected this to my PC. So when I draw on the tablet, I see the entire screen. Right, so the tablet is, that's an app that actually just extends uh, the PC displays to this tablet. So I can duplicate my second display to this tab. And when I draw on the screen, this will be like a mouse input, something like that. And then I use an application that is called Epic Pen. So with Epic Pen, you can just paint on any display or screen. And when you use that in combination with a drawing tablet, you can actually produce pretty great drawings by using an iPad or a Samsung Galaxy Tab. It doesn't actually matter what's the input. You can even paint with a mouse there, but you can yeah, highlight certain sections. You can create diagrams, whatever so far. So that's, that's a pretty good. Okay, next we have crap. <laughs> using Terraform for such a thing is really a bad idea. Overcomplicated, unmaintainable and inflexible. Terraform is for creating VMs, volumes and stuff. It's not configuration tool. Uh, well, that probably was dedicated to my video where I deployed a whole Kubernetes cluster with some of the services on Terraform. Well, um, and I would, I would disagree with a thing like that because tools like Terraform, Ansible, they are not really made for one specific purpose and they are just um, dedicated for that. I, I think like in IT, um, everyone needs to use the tools in the way that makes sense, right? I mean, it's not that you can't do things like Terraform. I mean, why would a Terraform registry or a Terraform provider deploying Kubernetes services would exist if it wouldn't make any sense, right? So <laughs> because there are providers that do those things, I assume other people will use the tools for the exact same purpose. So why shouldn't I do that? I mean, it, it kind of doesn't make any sense, but yeah. And next is from I am Spider. Oh, Spider. Whoa, this is awesome. Thank you uh, for this video. Good job. I am also using Packer and Terraform for my VMs. And um, I am also using Argo workflows to rebuild my template every second day so that my template is 100% up to date. Well, thank you so much for your feedback. And uh, Spider, I know you are on my Discord and you're always helping me when I have some problems with Packer and Terraform. That is absolutely awesome. Thank you so much for that. And I think I needed to give you a shout out on one of the community videos anyway. And that's a pretty great feedback. I, I actually haven't um, gone through Argo workflows or Argo CD. That's a tool or a work flow that I want to learn myself or want to teach myself in the following year. So learning CICD is a hot topic on my list and I probably will come to this yeah, in, in this year, maybe even in the following year. But yeah, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a software developer, so I'm not really familiar with topics like this, but th that is something that I absolutely want to learn. So this is really amazing. And using Argo workflows to rebuild templates and update 
uh, package is also a pretty great idea. So I I might I might discuss that with you on Discord going forward. <laughs> Next from Theodore Ganescu. Uh, I hope I pronounced that correctly. I'm sorry, mate. Well, I'm glad someone agrees that traffic's documentation is. <laughs> I spent countless hours just testing various approaches and guessing values and structure because there is simply no documentation. And I tried to find how much does traffic support actually cost. Not gonna say how much, <laughs> I just say 90% of small mid businesses will not afford that. So I pour another coffee back to testing various approaches again. Um, yeah, that's pretty interesting. I also thought like the traffic documentation is kind of, well, I wouldn't say it is completely or entirely bad, but it's really fragmented. So when you are trying to search for specific things, you need to uh, get your mind into the thinking process of traffic. And that is actually difficult because traffic can be configured in so many different ways. So it can be configured on Kubernetes, on Docker, with static or dynamic configuration. It's completely confusing, right? And that, that actually takes a long time. So it has a pretty steep learning curve. I agree on that. But I think it's also a pretty great solution, right? There's no real yeah, I, I think there are, of course, there are some competitors to traffic, but I think traffic is a very great software package and a very good solution that is very flexible. That flexibility also makes it complicated, but that is always kind of the, the thing in IT. Complicated things tend to be flexible and flexible things tend to be complicated. But yeah, I, I agree with you. The traffic documentation that could be definitely better. And it's interesting to read about the support cost. I, I actually have no experience with that. Next is from Mason. Hey Mason, good to see you. Eh? One of the, my um, earliest subscribers here on the channel. Hey Christian, do you have any ideas on what's something that this costs to run per day? Ah, he is uh, referring to my home server rack. So all of the devices that I built into my home server rack, the servers, the storage server, firewall and so, so on. How much um, kilowatts? I'm thinking of looking at doing something like this myself, but the prices of electric these days is putting me off at the moment. Great content as always. Oh, thank you. That's awesome. Yeah, because you are one of the earliest subscribers here on the channel. I really appreciate that feedback. And yeah, that's a pretty great question. So I will address this question in a separate video because I actually um, I measured some of the um, kilowatts um, or power consumption of some of the servers, but I really didn't do any analytics over a couple of weeks. So that is something that is still on my list, but I probably will buy another power supply or power delivery unit on the server rack that can display me the, the power consumption in real time. So then I can just write it down and make some calculations over a week or maybe even two weeks to find out what it actually costs me to run such a an incredible home server rack at home. I, I never really cons considered measuring this. Um, yeah, I have done some ro some rough calculations, but um, yeah, I will address that in a separate video. I think that will be pretty interesting. And next, your PCMD. Good video, but why did you not go the easy route? I have a Dell R420 with 196 gigabytes of RAM, dual 10 core, 20 thread CPUs, and four 12 terabyte NAS drives, altogether cost like under $1,200. Whoa, you got a lot of RAM. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. And yeah, I know this. So um, I, I also ordered um, a lot of refurbished servers on eBay um, a few years ago, and I always yeah purchase these yeah these refurbished or, or used server hardware. You can get really uh, cheap powerful servers by doing this. I know it. But uh, the main problem or downside with this is they produce a lot of noise. And I have my server rack directly beside the YouTube studio. So I could not record any videos when a fan would be running with 100% RPM. So not only the case fans, also the power supply fans are producing that noise and you can't really replace these fans on a power supply unit. And that's the reason why I wanted to build this myself. Also, I enjoyed building this even though it got me into a lot of trouble, but yeah, it was it was a pretty interesting learning process for me to build a servers. Yeah, and I also can show you that how it's working. So I thought it would be an interesting topic to not just buy um, a, a real server equipment, just yeah, or order all the parts, assemble them. And yeah, that was a really fun project. But yeah, you're actually right. You can do some pretty great or you can get some pretty great deals on eBay. That's that's really possible. 
Next from Extra TNT, I think that is uh, that is related to my my um, video about my Windows terminal customizations. You know where I'm using PowerShell and uh, WSL. In this case, why do you even want to touch Windows? GNU Linux is faster, the shell is better, it's customizable, there are tiling window managers, you have a package manager. On Windows, it's pain to write a document, always use LaTeX, blah, 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 blah. I won't read the whole comment because it's actually most... <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I don't want to blame on you here in this video, but uh, I could easily pick like... Yeah, any other comment on my Linux Windows videos, it is just always the same. Like people want to convince me that Linux is better and Windows is crap and why am I using Windows and why I'm not using Linux and blah, blah, blah. It's always the same kind of co co conversation. And to be honest, guys, I'm so sick of this conversation. I don't want to comment on this, but I I, find, I wanted to address it on a video like this, right? But because I just, uh, hey, if you like Linux, if you want to use Linux, yeah, you, you're fine. Just just go and use it. Yeah, I don't really care what you're using on, on your PC. It's your, your workflow. Yeah, D just do what you think is best for you. But saying this, I would also assume like you can let me do the stuff in the way that I want it to do, right? So please don't judge me for using Windows or using this or that tool. That is just the way how I want to do it. And yeah, if people are calling me out on comments like this, hey, why don't you use Linux? I just say, yeah, because I don't want it. <laughs> so that's it. No, I have nothing more to say, right? I don't really care about the operating system or the tools. I always just use the tools that work best for the stuff that I want to make. So yeah, just let me do that, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Next comment for Muta Tech Tips. Why do you have no hair? <laughs> do I really need to comment on this? Next from Palvaran. Great view as always. Oh, thank you so much. I work in enterprise infrastructure and we have seen multiple drives fail because at nearly the same time and the added strain of a typical rebuild of other drives increasing the likelihood of other driving failure. Whoa, what a sentence. <laughs> as such, I would recommend at least ZFS RAID Z2. Well, this is regarding my um, storage server video where I just put 12 4 terabyte hard drives in a RAID Z1 with a lot of people commented on, hey, this is not a good idea. Um, if one drive fails and you're rebuilding the storage pool and another drive fails at this point, your complete entire storage pool is lost, the data is lost. You really must hate your data, some people said. If you're using RAID Z1 on 12 hard drives, this is insane. And yeah, I'm kind of a maniac when it comes to that. I'm always just, yeah, testing stuff on production servers and throwing 12 uh, terabyte hard drives on RAID Z1. But yeah, I agree this is probably not a good solution. And I, I will probably change it, right? You see, I'm not really an expert on all of these uh, things. I really, I don't know much about server hardware. Uh, yeah, I just know the basics. I worked with a couple of uh, servers like seven or 10 years ago um, when I did my IT. Uh, apprenticeship, right? Uh, but in recent past, I'm actually not up to date to any hardware stuff. Yeah, so just excuse that in some of the videos I go through a lot of trial and errors and things are changing. But that's why I don't really make these videos as kind of a tutorial. So hey, here is how you need to build a storage server. I never really said something like this. I made the video in the way like, hey, this is how I have done it. And it may have some issues. It may have some stupid decisions. <laughs> that's okay. But it's just I want to document the process of my project. So I'm also documenting all of the, yeah, the, the, the bad stuff. And I would say this is not a really a terrible uh, mistake that I made. So if that would be a terrible mistake that I think I would need to correct, I would probably just upload another video about this. But hey, this is something like it, it works in a RAID Z1. It's probably not the best decision. I know it. And I'm going to change that in the future. Maybe that's worth an update video. We will see. Panagiotis uh, Gro Groidis. Oh, I'm sorry, to, it's really hard to pronounce. I'm so sorry. I really like the ASCII flows. How did you manage to add icons within ASCII? It should be some ASCII code, but with what font? That's a pretty great question. And I used this fonts on some of my ASCII diagrams. So if you have seen that, and I also got a lot of questions regarding these diagrams. So I'm using ASCII flow to draw these diagrams because that's really easy. You can just copy all of this stuff and put this in a simple text editor, VS code or markdown language. And then I also do some handwork. So I replace some of this uh, stuff with some icons from nerd fonts. So nerd fonts, these are the fonts that I use in VS code that I use in Obsidian. And I also use it on my terminal. So whenever this ASCII code is um, 
of writing an icon that is present in one of the nerd fonts. Uh, when you open this diagram with an editor that has a nerd font, you can display these icons. So that's a pretty great solution. I just like it. It's kind of nerdish. It's probably not the best way to draw diagrams, but I really don't care. I like them. And I like to display yeah, diagrams in a terminal. That is just awesome, right? So yeah, I use ASCII flow and nerd fonts for doing this. Jason Weir. Uh, possibly I missed it, but why did you pick K3S versus, say, micro Kubernetes or other options? Great information. Just always curious why people pick one solution. Thank you so much for your feedback. Yeah, that's a pretty great question. So that's regarding my Kubernetes video, um, Kubernetes at home with K3S. And yeah, I know there are some uh, other, uh, I know there are other solutions out there, something like micro Kubernetes or K0S. Uh, I think there's also Minikube out there. And yeah, I know there are plenty of different solutions. And that's always a question, so why did I pick one solution? Why did I pick traffic over Caddy or HA proxy? Why did I pick K3S over micro Kubernetes? I probably could go another route. I could pick another tool, that's possibly true. But um, I need to... I need to say, well, I always I always pick my tools on a specific purpose. So I always do, I, I'm not going through this process like I, I test tool one, I test tool two, three, and so on, and I then decide what is the best tool. That's not how I'm doing it. I always feel like these projects are helping me to learn new stuff in IT that will benefit uh, my IT career. So where I get the most valuable knowledge out of a project that I learn at home. And I think you should do the same. I, I think that's why we're doing this as serious IT professionals and IT guys, right? If, if your focus is home lab and self-hosting, that might be a different goal, okay? I, I know this, but if you are in professional IT business and you want to learn something at home that will benefit your IT career, then I would always pick the tool that has the most value in the IT industry. And when you compare K3S to another solution like Micro Kubernetes or Minikube, it's a, a really a tool that the vast majority of companies are using and I did some researching about that. Even Sivo, my favorite uh, cloud provider, is also using K3S to power the entire SaaS Kubernetes solution. So you can see even if a big cloud provider like Sivo is using K3S, there must be a point to it. It must be a valuable software. And if you do some researching about this, you will see that K3S is one of the most popular and the most versatile solution to deploy Kubernetes. And you can see, well, if that's a project you can easily do in your home lab completely for free, it's open source. Well, this is a great project or a great topic for me to take on because then I can educate you in something. I can teach you something that will give you the most value or the most benefit in your IT career in professional IT business. So this is always the topic that I, or the, the goal that I focus on. So that is why I sometimes pick a tool over another great solution. As something like traffic will follow in the same category because I pick traffic over something like HA proxy or caddy not because it's better or it's easier no it's because most companies that use um, cloud native workflows are using traffic I see that I did some researching on how popular traffic is in Kubernetes and cloud environments so that's why I pick this tool not because it's the best tool but because it will give you the most or the the most value for your professional IT career that's that's a real reason. <laughs> okay, so I think I got over all of the interesting stuff that I could find in the last three or four weeks. But hey, yeah, if you have any other questions, I just said it, like put it in the comments. And I will do another community update, another Q&A in a couple of weeks or one or two months. We will see how frequently I will do this. So yeah, I hope you enjoy videos like this and that should be all for today. So thanks everybody for watching and yeah, I will catch you in the next video in the next Q&A. Take care. Bye bye.